let's, uh, let's give it up for Ben Yera. Okay. All right. So thank you for having me. Um, big fan of you guys' products. I think uh, the majority of stuff we do is on YouTube, so it's greatly appreciated. Um, so the sort of purpose of this talk is, I think I'll say this, in, I used to teach at a few different universities, and I would meet a lot of people doing really interesting and important work. And I'd always try to get them to, oh, I've got to share that on YouTube. Got to, got, got to get that out to more people. These are, these are great ideas. There's, there's such a bigger audience for this than what you would think. And it's actually really hard to get people to do that. There's these stigmas about really broad platforms that uh, make people reluctant to, to experiment. So uh, it's just really hard to get credentialed people to step into a really chaotic environment. There's, there's so much more comfortable with a curated one where they know their audience. So I want to show that uh, despite the flaws of some of these platforms, uh, there are some really exciting ways to use them. And the reason why I think this is so important is the, the challenges that I'm interested in are really big ones that just simply won't get solved by one person, one piece of technology. Uh, 3D printing will never make houses affordable. Shipping container houses will not make housing affordable. It's going to be a collection of a whole bunch of little things stacked on top of each other and then tested and reconfigured that will improve things over time. And what's difficult when it comes to affordable housing is that these things are not all in one discipline. Only a tiny fraction of them are related to architecture and design or even construction. A lot of them have to do with how houses are financed. It has to do with what kind of local regulations there are. And even regulations at the federal, state, and county level uh, all have to be, so they all have to be considered and a plan has to be worked out to, to take advantage of all of them. It's the kind of situation where a top-down solution just isn't going to make that big of a difference. It's more where we need thousands of ideas with millions of people giving us feedback, uh, finding things that we're not seeing, and uh, then also being able to implement their feedback as well. I think of it as like we need to stack all these ideas as like little building blocks, reconfigure, test, create case studies, and then keep going. And so far, the best place for this to happen, in, in my opinion, is the, the most powerful platform for sharing instruction, and that's YouTube. And I know that the, the most popular content on YouTube isn't always great. So, sometimes it is. Mark Rober throws out some stuff that I'm always just really pleased to see uh, trending. But an, ignoring a platform as a tool, because a lot of the people on it watch dumb stuff, uh, would be like not writing a science book because the Bible is the most popular book of all time. So when smart, te uh, smart people tell me why they avoid YouTube, <laughs> it usually involves something like this. They had a sort of a bad reaction to a video with just, just massive view numbers that, you know, uh, I think my last friend I tried to convince, he says, why would I want to be on a platform where f flaming piles of feces are regularly rewarded? And I, I didn't have a great rebuttal, but I think Hopefully, uh, this talk will be one. Um, and I can empathize. I feel the same way. It's like if, you're, if you put a lot of time and effort and expertise into something, and you see it does just a tiny fraction of what something else does, you're like, man, I am I'm really not appreciated. But that being said, the platform can absolutely be leveraged to create progress around serious challenges. And this is something I've been testing for uh, almost six years now. And I'm very, very optimistic. So uh, a little bit of context to my interest and also to the optimism. Um, and in particular, why I became interested in design in the first place. Uh, I grew up relatively poor. And design was a way to access things and experiences we otherwise couldn't afford. I remember all four of us kids sharing a single room. Not because not it was crowded, but uh, my mother made these really ingenious beds that all folded out from the wall. She's got some foam from the, the fabric store, sewed the covers on them, and we were able to transform a single room for four kids from a, a very efficient sleeping dorm to like a wide open arts and crafts studio. Uh, I remember my brother and I reading Huckleberry Finn, and we immediately built a raft out of uh, two liter soda bottles that we sailed down our, our local river. So design was about creating access, new things, new experiences, no matter how limited the resources. Then I went to architecture school, and design was a little more esoteric. It was 
about theory and concept. Absolutely loved it. Um, and as students at that time, we were really into the, the brilliant work that was commissioned by glamorous brands like Prada and Guggenheim. That, that was the hot stuff at the moment that everyone was talking about. And design and architecture felt like this, this very elevated pastime where you could go to really cool cities and, and meet really fancy people. And my friends, who would later become my business partners, we were, we were intrigued by architecture as high art. But we were interested in something that felt a little bit more substantial and down to earth. So we became interested in sustainable design. And after graduating, started an architecture firm and began designing high performance homes like this. So we designed solar powered, super insulated homes that produced as much energy as they use. It was great. We won a whole bunch of awards. We continue to get published. Uh, our commission and client list becomes uh, more elite. But uh, these homes were also quite expensive and often were second homes for our clients. So while the technology was sustainable and progressive, the application of it wasn't exactly, you didn't really feel like you were changing the world. Um, and our conscience was telling us to design sustainably, but our business model was pushing us to primarily deliver it to the wealthy. So of course, we did pro bono work. Uh, this is a competition that we won to design affordable homes in New Orleans for residents displaced by Hurricane Katrina. But it was the exception, and it, these things come with financial consequences, so they get occasional secondary focus. And it honestly takes just as long to design an affordable house as it does an expensive house. And it's also a little bit harder, because you don't have money just to solve problems. Um, so it, it, was, it was really tricky, and it was very disappointing. Um, you know, we, we were such crusaders as students, thinking about, oh, you know, sustainability. This is the, the issue of our time and our generation. And we're going to do it through architecture. And then we get into architecture, do the right thing, start a firm at a really uh, early age, uh, get recognition from our peers and uh, the, the generations came before us, but still felt frustrated about some aspects of the business model. So, I am super proud of the firm we created. I'm proud of the homes we designed. But I really wanted my career to be about creating new opportunities, not catering to those that already had them. So I, I don't subscribe to trickle-down economics. So why was I designing for the most privileged and then hoping the technology and the progressive parts will eventually trickle down? So what to do about it? How do you earn a living designing for people that can't afford to hire you? So, I remembered one of my architecture professors, and he always would say, architects don't make buildings. They make drawings that instruct and motivate. And I realized that drawings are a type of media, and media can be distributed over the internet. And instructing and motivating a lot of people over the internet could be impactful and probably lucrative. And so these were the thoughts in the, the, the back of my head when I had drinks with a friend who's a furniture designer. And he complained that, it was impossible to design affordable American-made uh, furniture out of real materials. He said that the reality of the industry is you've got to do high-end and boutique and custom work until you build up this brand for yourself. And then eventually, maybe a big retail chain will create like a, a very compromised sweatshop-made knockoff with your name on it. And so I bet him. That kind of cynicism just always just, it just makes some sort of contrarian part of me just want to like, even if I don't see the idea at the moment, just like, pick at it until I can prove them wrong. So I bet him that I could get 1,000 units of affordable American-made furniture delivered around the country for less than their IKEA counterpart. He took the bet because he believed that it would be impossible for me to deliver something as cheap as IKEA. IKEA has, a fac has factories, ships, and over 100,000 employees all aimed at making the production and delivery of furniture cheap and efficient. I had none of those things, just my hands and a couple basic power tools. I think I had a circular saw and a drill at the time. So he took the bet because he believed that in order to get design to the masses, you had to turn it into a product first. And in order to make a product, you have to spend time and money on prototyping, manufacturing, shipping, marketing, and all those things. So he made the bet because he didn't see the shortcut. But I knew I was just going to make a YouTube video. So this is the bucket stool video. I posted it on YouTube. I think it was probably like the third video I posted. Um, shared it on Facebook. It's a, it's a very simple design. It can be made for about $5. Uh, you just cut a few sticks, put about two to three inches of concrete in the bottom of a five gallon bucket, uh, wait overnight, and then pop out this sturdy little three-legged stool. 
and, and I, think it's, I think it's much nicer than the, the more expensive IKEA counterpart. Um, and all of this was before I had much of a social media audience. And I was basically sharing it with friends and family, but a lot of them <laughs> shared it too. And very quickly, people around the world started posting proof that my design idea had reached their physical reality. So this project has now been built on six different continents, and several small businesses produce it and sell it. Um, I won the bet, uh, but more importantly, uh, I saw that this could be a business where I could do exactly what I wanted, design for people who couldn't hire me, because I was producing media content that motivated, instructed, and resulted in economic activity. In order to build this design, uh, not everyone has concrete lying around, so people had to go out and purchase tools and materials. And since I didn't have the infrastructure to provide them with it, I had to direct them elsewhere. And because I didn't have this infrastructure to compete with IKEA, I had to hijack that from some other place to make it universally accessible. So I looked around and said, ah, Home Depot. So I designed projects out of materials that are universally available due to the trucks, warehouses, and stores that they are paying for. And the result is digital media content that encourages people to go to their stores and buy stuff. And because I didn't have the marketing budget to compete with Target, I had to hijack viewers from BuzzFeed and Pinterest. And because the content I was creating was original and novel, uh, they were happy to share it with their millions of viewers. So basically, I was producing design as a type of media and monetizing it as marketing. And so now I had a great incentive to share more designs. So we started simple. We try to make easy to make projects to promote a, a healthy lifestyle, a lot of plants, uh, easy to build stuff. Uh, again, we were working with very limited tools. This was one of the early projects that I really enjoyed. We made these concrete pendant lamps and we just used plastic bottles to, to make the molds. They're about three to five dollars to make and if you go to a boutique store and try to buy concrete pendant lamps, they're gonna be like 200 bucks at least. And it's not that these lamps like make or break somebody's ho house and are, are, well I guess they could break it, they're kind of heavy, but um, they're not like super critical, but it is really encouraging when you think something's out of reach and you realize with just a few hours and a little bit of ingenuity, you can actually have something that was previously you thought for a uh, people a few economic classes above you. Uh, we would really try to work with just the most basic things, like just two by fours. How do we clean up two by fours and actually make them look like clean, aspirational Scandinavian furniture? Uh, this is a table I really like. It's made out of a single sheet of plywood. The entire materials for this table cost about $40, depending on where you're at in the, the country. Um, you only need a circular saw and a drill and a piece of sandpaper to make it. Um, it's, even with the tools, it would be less than an IKEA table that would probably be made out of an inferior material like particle board. Um, we start experimenting with metal, adding those in to kind of expand our, our material library. Made pieces for every room in the house even tried to do things every once in a while that didn't involve any power tools. Like there's still that, that barrier to entry for people to make something for the first time. Sometimes they don't feel comfortable with something that could, they feel could injure them. Um, so this is a project that can all be made with handheld tools. It's made out of copper and the joints are just glued together. Uh, we did indoor and outdoor projects. And it was going really great. Uh, we went very quickly past 10 million views. And as a designer, it was it was such fun, like instant gratification. I could, I could have an idea on a Thursday, sketch it, think about it a little bit, sketch it out on a Friday, build it on a Saturday, you know, just put a camera on a tripod while I was doing it. There's no fancy production here. And then uh, edit the video, it normally took about a day. And then by Monday, thousands of people were watching an idea I just had the week before. So my entrepreneurial friends at the time, though, were always like, Oh, you got to build out your email list, uh, and then you can like develop products and sell them to the audience. One, I hate people to send me extra emails, and so it's like I, I wouldn't want to do that to anyone else. Um, and also, I don't really want to develop products and sell them. Now, I get their concern; they were worried that I would run out of ideas eventually, and I wouldn't have monetized the ones that I already gave away. Um, so I was going to just, just why don't you make and sell stuff? And there's two main reasons. And one is from a business perspective, it's, it's way lower risk and higher return to create media content that reaches millions than it is to spend money on patents, manufacturing, distribution, and marketing. And then more importantly, creatively, I spend my time with new ideas, not value engineering old ones. And so quite simply, this model allows my fiscal future to be firmly grounded in my creative present. 
And for me, that's what work-life balance is. It's not, it's not how much you work. It's not how many hours. Sometimes that's going to be a lot. Sometimes it, it's going to be less. But it's having that right calibration of what you believe in being how you earn your keep. And so if I were to develop products, uh, I would spend months, but probably even more like years, on ideas that I already had. And while I was developing those, I, those old ideas, anything new that comes in is kind of a distraction. It's really easy when you're trying to fit. I mean, that's why finishing things is so hard, because you've already used all the good parts. And then like new stuff is coming in. You're like, no, got to figure out that last 10%. So this actually uh, really plays well to uh, my sort of generally not super organized way of designing. So I also just get to bet on curiosity and intellectual abundance instead of scarcity. So I still get emails, though, all the time, particularly with Etsy links showing, like, these people are stealing your ideas and they're selling them. They're making all this money. And I was going, it's great. It's, it is. It's like when, when other people make my stuff and then sell it, I like looking at it because often they figured out a way to make it more efficient. I get this sort of free crowdsourced R&D, and then I often I'll take some of the ideas that I see there and then fold that into the next generation of projects. So yes, please steal these ideas because the surest way to run out of new ideas is to hold on too tightly to the old ones. So this was, this was the, the most satisfying period of my career. Um, but even in, in, when that's the case, there's, there's always something that's kind of lingering at the, the back of you. You're never completely happy, unfortunately. Uh, or if you figure that out, come talk to me afterwards, because I'm curious. Uh, so I still felt a little bit secure at times. Is I, I imagined, I'm not sure if they actually did it, but I always imagined like, my, my fancier architectural peers sort of like, he became a YouTuber? Like, I mean, come on, like, wh why? Um, and I was comfortable with that, like objectively, but it did cross my mind that I had given up on some more traditional types of peer recognition, which you don't want to live your life by, but honestly, they're still really nice and they make you feel good. And, but then it turned out that I was worrying about nothing. Uh, the Vitra Furniture Museum uh, asked if they could use my plywood and zip tie chairs uh, for, I think these I think could be made for about $25 each. And they were wanting to use them for an exhibition and workshop that was teaching people how to make and design. And I will probably never design a Prada store, but I did, did, did get to work with a supermodel Coca Rocha who wanted some bucket stools for her own home. And what's great, it's, it's not that the work is in museums or fancy people's homes. I mean, that's, that's kind of clever and it's, it's nice and it feels good at times, but the key part is that these things are desirable to people and institutions that have lots of options, but attainable to those that don't. And, and that was the goal, to make aspirational things that anyone could afford. I, I just love this way of working. It's that you, when, you, when you see an idea travel and then physically appear thousands of miles apart from people of all different economic levels, it's, it's just a very encouraging uh, uh, sense that ideas mean more than just about everything else. So the same idea that's at uh, Coco's house is also used at schools and churches in Uganda. Um, and I finally felt that like the kind of the ethical, creative, and career interests were all sort of aligned into one type of work. So I was feeling more motivated, decided to expand a bit. Uh, I hired my little sister, Jessie, uh, as a partner so we could work on uh, larger projects. Her professional background is perfectly suited to this. She's a uh, former violinist, uh, lumberjack, and librarian, so she can handle YouTube. Um, and it really let us sort of up our game, just having an extra set of hands. So we started saying, huh, in addition to the videos, let's add more supporting documentation. Let's create dimension drawings. Let's start thinking about the modularity of projects, how they can be expanded for more different environments. Um, this is a plywood home office. Uh, four basic power tools required and about 60 bucks worth of plywood. We built out a whole kitchen. We even made the countertops out of concrete. Uh, making your own concrete countertops will save you a few thousand dollars, even against the, the cheapest countertop options. And we started thinking not just about individual pieces, but started putting a bunch of these affordable pieces into room settings where we could show that like, just because you're DIYing doesn't mean your whole house is going to look really janky or cheap. We also started to experiment with technology. So for my Boston building, I needed a spiral staircase. And the cheapest options that I saw were about, I think they're like 2,500, and they were really noisy, 
not great looking uh, metal stairs that when if you walk on them, the whole thing kind of rattles and uh, makes a ton of noise. So we got this machine. It's a $1,200 machine from Inventables called the X-Carve. Um, the software is all free. And then we just used normal plywood from Home Depot to make this spiral staircase. Um, people love this project. Uh, it's, uh, it's been repeated a few times because we made the actual CNC files uh, public. I haven't tracked them all down, but I know a few different developers have then uh, adapted this for actually commercial developments. Um, it did well on YouTube. I think it hit like just over a million views. And when it did that, a lot of other media organizations, particularly ones that have big followings on Facebook, reached out for us and said, hey, can we share this video? And that's kind of a tricky thing, because for most YouTubers, they want to keep all their content on the channels where they make money when they get views. And so we were sort of torn. It's like, well, we said we want to share this with a lot of people. But if we're only doing it whenever we get paid, like, it's kind of, it's not the worst thing, but it's not a great thing. So we decided to start giving away the content in addition to the, the design ideas themselves. So Business Insider did a, a video on Facebook. Uh, it did over 10 million views. Uh, Five Minute Crafts did a one. It did over 10 million views. And there's probably, if you, I don't know how many there are now, but if you just look Spiral Staircase on Facebook, you'll probably see like 10 or 20 of these. So it's probably been viewed somewhere between 100 and 200 million times. So we experimented with more technology. This is a project we did with uh, 3D printers. Um, it's a fire pit. And I have sort of a, a love-hate relationship with 3D printing. The technology is amazing. The way it gets talked about, particularly in media that doesn't know a lot about making, is just garbage. If I see any more of these things, like affordable house 3D printed in one day for like $20,000, they did not print the house. They printed walls. I could make those same walls with one other guy and a nail gun and a bunch of two by fours for way cheaper and probably faster. They're not printing the windows. They're not pr printing the conduit. They're not even printing the structure and the insulation. They're normally doing those things separate. This technology is not going to save us. And so waiting around and pretending that it is is just deluding us from actual solutions that are going to work. The other favorite thing about 3D printing was people always saying, oh, well, eventually, People won't order stuff. They'll just download files and print this. And I'm like, do you, do you have an inkjet printer? Have you, ever, have you ever used one? Have you ever thought, I'm not going to buy a book on Amazon. I'm just going to print a PDF <laughs> and then bind it together? Like, you know how like the Amazon book would actually get there faster than what that would take. Um, and because the idea was that people like to take, they hear a word like disruption, and then they just use that word, because it's happened before in really specific circumstances, and just apply that into all kinds of cases where it doesn't belong. Yes, home-based 3D printers will get better, just as those inkjet printers, as hard as it is to believe, are better than they used to be. But so will the centralized ones. So it's not a question of 3D printing or not and whether that's going to disrupt. It'll be the question of sort of centralized versus decentralized production. Uh, so this project kind of embodies how we do think about 3D printing, where you print just a little bit, and then you, you try to uh, uh, extrapolate that through some other sort of means of making molds or fabrication or prototyping, and then you introduce a really cheap material like concrete, which, you know, 80 pounds for $5, and then you really get the value out of the nimbleness and uh, uh, precision of these kind of tools. So this is the, the El Camino of sofas. Um, we started experimenting and started realizing that we don't have to make stuff that looks like everybody else's stuff. People weren't really happy with the sofa options they had. This one was a really popular project for us because people will get a sofa, and then they have to get another piece of furniture to put behind it if it's not up against the wall. So we made this, uh, this nice little desk that goes along the back. It's actually great for like viewing parties and small apartments because you get that sort of second row of seating that's elevated above and looks over people's shoulders only good if they're not annoying chewers. We started getting more audacious with our designs. We did a series of lounge chairs, not the most essential thing in every house, but they look great. Um, these ones can be made with just three to four basic power tools, even the curvy ones. Uh, we experiment with uh, niche lifestyles. This is a CrossFit gym that folds up and only takes about two square feet of interior space. I really like this bed. This is something actually we did more recently. We were like thinking about 
how do you make a bed designed for the way people actually live, which is, you know, sitting on them with there with a laptop, possibly snacks, uh, not having great work-life balance. And the materials for this bed are only about 180 bucks. It has a ton of storage built into it. And again, you just need three basic power tools to make it. We think urban food production is really important. Uh, we started working with indoor automated gardens to allow food to be grown all year round. Uh, Jesse came up with a really great way to recycle plastic bags into a synthetic leather. And we were able to start influencing the brands that we were working with. So we collaborated with Home Depot and built this solar powered tool shed. Now it's not that like the actual amount of energy that this, these you know, few solar panels produce is important. What's important is that it's encouraging people not to use gas-powered lawn mowers and leaf blowers and things like that. One, they're super noisy and annoying to your neighbors. But more importantly, those small engines like disproportionately pollute because there isn't the same level of scrutiny and standards on them. So pound for pound, they're some of the worst things that uh, uh, we have. And so there are electric options. And so you show this sort of whole package thing and it moved a ton of product for uh, Home Depot. I think it was like, it's sitting at around like four and a half million views for a video that's highly, highly technical. Um, and so this changed the way we thought. It also changed the way they thought when they started working with us. And they, they started, it really made the gears start turning is that they didn't actually, they paid us really well from what we were thinking, but relative to what they spend on a TV commercial, it was a drop in the bucket had a way bigger impact, and it was just had minutes and minutes of engagement. I think the video is about 12, 12 minutes long or so. And so when you think about that and four and a half million views versus a 30 second commercial, do you know how much money they would spend to make that, to get that amount of watch time for a video that people don't want to watch? But that's still what they do a lot. Um, so it was going great. We hit a million subscribers, which is a pretty big milestone as far as YouTubers go. And it's typically the inflection point where an individual content creator says, you know what, time to become a big media company. And we, at this time, we had done probably over 200 projects. And I wanted to do more, but I wasn't sure uh, what kind of more. So the question of how do we scale started to shift to what should we scale and why? So we could scale the business and successful YouTubers build these big teams because the, I don't know if it's true or not, but everyone thinks that consistency is so important. You've got to post every week. And it's just not the right move for us. We're, we're not on any sort of production schedule. We don't want the algorithm or our perception of that dictating the, the creative. I mean, these platforms are amazing tools. They're absolutely terrible bosses. And we saw that kind of and that's why they all complain about burnout. It's not burnout, it's greed. They, wanted, they were already at a stage where they were completely sustainable and they said, you know what, we want more and we want to do more through the same formula. Um, and that just doesn't, I mean, it's lucrative, it's great. Bigger audience is somewhat more powerful, but what we already saw with like the Facebook example is that if we had an idea that was really popular or really important, that we, that we just thought like, this is a great idea, this could, this could impact things. Even if it doesn't do well on our channels, there's ways to make sure it gets seen. So uh, we weren't sure that just scaling audience and production was the right thing. So instead, we wanted to scale the projects. We wanted to go, well, we, we didn't know. We were curious to whether the same kind of approach to doing affordable interior design and home furnishing and home improvement projects could get scaled up to the architectural scale. And we wanted to build an entire house from scratch. So uh, we decided to do a docu-series on building a shipping container house uh, from the ground up. Uh, now, building and filming an entire house, even a small one, is, is a pretty expensive uh, endeavor to do out of pocket. So at first I reached out to some streaming platforms and uh, HGTV and other, other networks that they're always reaching out to YouTubers and trying to get you to do shows. And we hadn't come to the right sort of creative vision yet. So they're always like, okay, if you have a big idea, come pitch us. So we pitched them, and they were very interested in us and in the subject matter, but not our vision for it. So they said people aren't interested in instruction. They're not interested in how to get permits. They're not interested in how to hook it up to electricity and water. They're not interested in what happens with you flush a toilet. How do you go from putting a house on raw land to having it connected to a sewer? Or if you're too far from a sewer, where does the poop go? 
We thought people would be really interested in those things. They said, no, they just want to see before and afters. And so we wanted to do eight to 10 episodes building this single house in great detail. And they want us to build a house every episode. And by build, they really mean just sort of fake it. Um, so uh, we decided to do it on our own. And we reached out to Home Depot and pitched them. And they immediately said yes. And so we got to build it. And I think people do want technical information if if it's useful to them. Um, and so I mixed in live action video with architectural and engineering documents. I thought it was a great chance to sort of take these mysterious documents that shape the way our world is built and mix them right on top of the live action footage so people can start to make that connection. There's a lot of contractors and architects that have been in the game for a long time that really don't know every detail that goes into one of these basically legal contracts for how a building is built. Um, so one of our most popular episodes is the episode just on these like structural details, on the permitting process, how much money we, we spent, how, what are all the back and forth you have to go with these different municipal agencies. And we thought this was going to be so dry and boring, but people really loved it. They had also brought to light a whole bunch of regulations that they weren't even aware of. So for example, about 5% of the construction budget for this project went to a sprinkler system. Now, this is a steel house surrounded by rock. There's no sort of brush. This isn't a, a, a brush fire situation. There's egress within every, I mean, it's so small. There's like doors everywhere. So escaping it isn't an issue. Uh, it's already meeting all the other fire suppression codes. But because somebody passed legislation that requires this to be in every new home, you have to spend a, you know, 5% is not an insignificant amount of, the, uh, of, a, of a construction budget. Um, for something that not only, not only will it not be useful, it actually raises your insurance costs because it's way more likely that this system will fail um, and flood and cause moisture damage than it will save anyone from fire. And so we didn't have to make an argument for that. You, we can just show the process, and it made people really rethink some of their stances on legislation. And it's the type of things, like I, I never want to produce content that's political in nature, but it's a great way when you just make it about, here's the regulation, here's what you have to do to solve it, make no judgment about it, and then let people sort of uh, uh, come to their own conclusions. And what was interesting is that it did what's very rare on YouTube comment sections, where it actually made people reconsider positions they already had when it was just simply laid out in front of them. So we did hire some uh, some local uh, construction workers to, to help us. Um, me, Jesse and I did most of the, the steel work, though, while the welding. Uh, the permits, uh, they took a little bit longer than what we expected. So we ended up building it in the middle of uh, the summer in Joshua Tree, which is like 100 degrees. And so it's, it was basically like doing hot yoga for 10 hours a day. Um, we did get to demonstrate some really cool new tech. Uh, this is a system by Goal Zero. It's a very portable solar and battery system. And we actually use this to power about 90% of the power tools that I use, the exceptions where it didn't have enough uh, amps to power the welder and stuff like that. But it was, again, it's like it's really hard to convince grizzled general contractors to change anything. They're saying, oh, just use a generator. That's not going to work. And then they see that, and it's like, oh, that's quiet. Oh, I guess you can, since most of the tools are battery now. Oh, wow. That's really better. We can actually hear each other on the job site. We only need to turn the generator on for really big things, so that was kind of fun. We do think everything's interesting, uh, including questions like, where does the poop go? So we had a little bit of a problem. Because the, the ground is so inflammable and all made out of like stone and inorganic material, uh, we couldn't get the uh, we couldn't do a typical septic system in leach field. Uh, the, there just wasn't enough organic material to remediate the effluents uh, from the, the leach field. So we had to design a more creative septic system um, that sort of recycles that effluence and uses it for a flower garden. We're not bold enough to do food gardens. We would need a, a lot more expertise on uh, biological uh, contaminants to, to feel comfortable with that. And it's also, I think, illegal in California. But even something like this, like how do you do a septic system? It's just a little bit different. Did an excellent amount of views and uh, uh, really uh, uh, stirred up people's imaginations. So we finished the house. It took us about 18 to 20 weeks, which was way faster than what it took us to get permits. It was a lot of fun. Um, the sponsors were all really happy because we were able to showcase all their stuff. 
we didn't have complete design autonomy. I would have wanted to go, you know, if a brand or sponsor is putting a lot of money behind something like this, they want to see you use their best products, and I would have wanted to go with more market rate ones, but there's things that we do compromise on here and there. Um, it's a series of three little cabins uh, that are connected with some nice outdoor space, about 720 square feet. And then we started, you know, once it was done, we started thinking, well, how are we going to launch these videos? We put so much time into these, like, are we just going to put these on the Homemade Modern channel, which is our, our, our main channel? And I said, well, if I do that, I won't know how popular this content actually is. Um, if I put them on a channel with already a lot of subscribers, it will it'll only say how popular it is within the people that are already subscribed to me that then choose to click on it. So we launched an entirely new channel from scratch, which you know you still have to get through the monetization and all that part. So we knew we would lose quite a bit of AdSense revenue on that. But at least it would give us a really clear way of testing and would also show people that haven't spent any time on YouTube that, hey, if you do a really great docu-series, it doesn't matter if you've never spent any time like building up an audience. The algorithm actually works pretty well. And so what we were betting on is that a lot of people at some point in the last five years has searched for stuff around shipping container housings. And we were just trusting that the algorithm, even on a brand new channel with no subscribers, would serve that up. And it did. It works great. You guys are, are killing it. Keep it up. Uh, so five videos so far. We still got a few more in the can that uh, I got to edit. And uh, 15 million views, over 2 million hours of watch time. And for reference, relative to an HGTV show, their best shows are doing like 1.5 million views. And they're garbage. Um, so <laughs> we made the right decision. Let's see. So. I think there's this, this perception about YouTube that it's sort of a, if you're on a populist platform, it's a, it's a race to the bottom uh, in terms of the type of content you have to produce to stay competitive. But it's, it's not always the case. Uh, there isn't just a casual interest. There is a profound hunger for this type of documentation and information. People are very frustrated with their housing options. And if they see something, even if there's no way in hell they're ever going to build one of these, if they're just they just enjoy seeing someone do it. And then they, maybe they'll take one idea from the septic system. And, and actually, probably the most common question or comment that we get is that, like, wow, I wanted to do a shipping container house until I saw how, how hard it was. That's actually really good, too. That keeps people from, from uh, uh, making a wild goose chase on something that could be really financially harmful. So how do we go from one house to making some sort of impact on housing? Again, we're not going to solve it. Um, but but what, what, can, what can me and my sort of team do now with, with what we've created thus far to kind of, uh, well, to, to at least have some impact on making housing more affordable? So it won't be one thing. Um, it'll be a combination of these things. And there's way more factors that, that are at play here. But these are the ones that we think we have a clear play on that we can actually influence in the next like five to 10 years. So adding supply, increasing density, smaller footprints, simple designs, uh, integrated DIY projects, clear paths to permits, uh, different materials, new technologies, transportation solutions, and most importantly, case studies. And the reason why we need these case studies is we need them. You can come up with a new idea, and then the minute you try to implement it, some like homeowners association, the, the nimbyism, the not in my backyard stuff comes out really, really fast with anything new and innovative. And so the case studies are really important for one, shaping those people's opinions and actually showing that a lot of their concerns in, in many cases are, are invalid. Um, it's also really important to encourage financial institutions to be willing to finance construction on unusual projects. It's not that hard to design really cool stuff that could be amazing. It's really hard to convince a bank to do that. So even right now, if you design this new construction system, if you figured out some way to use like hemp and concrete and mix it all together, and you said, look, look at all the data. I have peer-reviewed studies on from all these credible engineers. This is going to save a ton of money. And it could be cheaper. The bank will still be like, yeah, looks risky. We're not going to give you the same financial package that we would something that's clearly not as good. So you have to innovate on all these levels. And that's where, again, we think showing these case studies is really important. 
there's been a few people now that are building uh, shipping container uh, homes or planting them in other parts of the country. They reached out for us and they asked, we, we currently have this house up on Airbnb. Um, they asked for sort of records and data of that. So they can take that information to the bank and look, this guy did it and it's working. He's making way above average uh, relative uh, to houses of that size because of the novelty factor and also probably because of the audience, to be fair. Um, and so they're actually using that and, and it's helping them actually secure loans against this kind of novel construction. So all of these ideas are sort of opportunities to impact cost and uh, have the potential to sort of de demonstrate a, a path forward. So here, here's what we're doing on the adding supply side. Uh, we just purchased a house for, for my sister, Jessie. It is a uh, completely abandoned house. It hasn't been occupied in over five years. So this is one of our, our case studies on sort of adding supply. Uh, it was a very low cost house that was sold at auction. She's going to be doing probably a total renovation for a sticker price of under like fifteen to twenty thousand to try to show that you could uh, revive one of these abandoned houses for uh, under six figures. Uh, increasing density is a really interesting thing. In fact, uh, you know, just this year there's a bunch of bills that got passed to make it way easier to permit an accessory dwelling unit. So there is actually political pressure, and there actually is really great change being made in this area. So an accessory dwelling unit is it's kind of seemed like a guest house or uh, sort of grandparents uh, a cabin in the backyard. But they created statewide legislation that makes this much more simple. So uh, we're going to do a, you know, a case study uh, that I think actually a lot of people will, will really relate to is uh, my grandmother is, is uh, slowing down a little bit. She's what, 95? Yeah. And uh, still pretty spry, but uh, you know we're not really the the, the nursing home kind of uh, family, so uh, we're trying to think about housing options for her. So we're going to do a, uh, a case study where we build one of these from scratch at my my parents' house, and we'll show how much it costs, the exact process to do that, and 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 this is the kind of content that I think YouTube was really made for, right? Where it's like it really takes a scenario that so many people can relate to. And then you mix in someone that has a little bit more expertise than everyone else to try to apply that, and then the knowledge gets shared all around. Uh, the smaller footprint things, uh, I mean, the average home, I mean, most homes get built by developers, so they're, they're building to the average, and the average is way too big. Um, so smaller homes means less cost, but not all the way down to the stupid tiny homes, because what those do is they actually get rid of all the cheap square footage. They just give you the expensive parts, so your cost per square foot is still way too high. The answer, as it is with most things, is some sort of moderation. Let's go smaller, but let's not get out of control, and just build like a cabinet that you can you know, basically sleep and then stand up and then cook. I always wonder with that, if like, people that live in these really tiny houses, it's like, if you make dinner, like, and you cook like some sort of like spicy food that has a little bit of a smell to it, and then you sleep three feet away, like, or do you have to take the trash out like every five minutes, or, I don't know. Um, that, that doesn't seem ideal. So uh, we're also gonna do simpler designs. So that's the problem with the tiny houses. They're actually smaller, but they're more complex. You wanna go smaller and also simple. You wanna keep it to four corners. You wanna do minimal interior finishes. You wanna use more durable materials, but, but just uh, fewer angles and articulation. And that's rare because the people that care about doing innovative design often also care about what their design portfolio looks like. So whenever architects try to do these, they're, they're fully capable of doing it, but they also want it to look different and they're afraid to do the small modest thing. They have to do the small novel thing every time. Uh, integrated DIY projects, uh, as with the last two categories, labor is a significant part of construction budgets. Uh, the more develop the, the country and the more expensive real estate, the higher the, the, the percentage of labor cost. Um, in LA and San Francisco, labor is a major part of construction. So going smaller reduces the labor, uh, simple reduces the labor, and also integrating DIY projects. So there's been so many times where I've seen, where I've had people reach out and be like, we just bought a brand new developer house, and now we're gonna tear out the brand new kitchen because it's designed to the average and it's gross, and we want to do something else. What do you recommend? It's just like, oh, I just wish those builders would have built houses without kitchens, offer them at a, at a discount to lower the barrier to entry, and then just have great documentation that shows all the different options that you can do yourself and save money. 
So we think these like integrated DIY projects actually have a lot of promise. Clear pass to permits. So this is a time and money kind of thing. Uh, and it's really important to empower homeowners to, to understand the permitting process. The reason why most houses are done by developers is because developers do this at scale and they do it over and over again and they get really good at it. And then when that happens, the whole system gets designed to slow developers down so they don't do exploitive stuff because their whole goal is to put as little money down, build as fast as possible, sell it as quickly as possible, and then never live in that house. So the, all these important defense mechanisms to, to try to make them more responsible also are in the way of individual homeowners, which is just like, man, I have to navigate this really complex system. So the more we can create sort of clear, easy to understand information content about how to get through permits, uh, the better we all will be. New materials are different materials, not really new. Um, windows and doors are one of the most expensive parts of homes. Um, so we're experimenting with uh, really high performance materials like uh, multi-walled polycarbonate panels. Uh, these are used in greenhouses. It's super strong, it's lightweight, way better uh, thermal performance than glass. Um, obviously, you won't be looking through these things. They're not perfectly clear. But for non-view windows, this is a great way to improve energy performance. And for comparison, they're probably about a sixth to a tenth of the price of, of glass uh, windows. New technology. So one of the really nice things about building up an audience and, and doing things is that you tend to attract people that are doing things in the same uh, area, but with a different approach. So we were approached by this company, Skip, um, and they're creating this just really, it's, it's, I was so skeptical at first, I like ignored the, the first three emails and then finally took them because a, a, a friend of a friend said, hey, they're, they're trying to reach you. Um, but what they've done is pretty incredible. They basically will take like a, a professional design kit, so they'll take like a palette or a style, something that can be on Pinterest or like sort of a mood board, and then they send like a Matterport scanner into your, uh, your home. They'll scan the whole area, and that immediately produces the working files that goes into Autodesk software. And then from there, they use AI to generate a whole bunch of layouts. It's, and they're actually like really good. All the, and what's even better is that they're pulling from a massive library of 3D models of everybody's products. Pretty much everyone now that sells appliances or cabinets has a 3D model of them somewhere, so they can just load that up, so they can give you much better pricing information, architecture grade, uh, construction do uh, documents, for projects that normally don't get this kind of professional design help. You know, most, most professional architects don't really want to do like a $20,000 kitchen renovation, there's just not enough meat on the bone to justify it as a service. So we're really excited to, to partner with these things and then also use their technology to take our designs and show not just one option that we could build in that particular setting, but show how you could extrapolate these for all sorts of different uh, sized dwellings. Now transportation becomes a big issue, particularly parking. Um, we've partnered with Zipcar and with uh, Mini's all new electric. Uh, they have some really interesting car sharing features built into this. We've had some success using these kind of ideas to get permitting and zoning exceptions in the past for our uh, Boston uh, multifamily building. We said, you know, we're really near public transportation. Why do we have to build three parking spots for three units? And I said, oh, we only had enough room for, for, for two parking spots. And we, will, there, we could stretch out the third one, but we'd have to only build two units. And, and we'd rather build more housing and less parking. And we're like literally like a hundred yards away from a subway station, and so we we pitched into the idea like, well, what if we actually deeded an electric car into the condo association of the building? It could be the car could be owned just like the HVAC equipment or anything else, and then one as a the developer spending an extra forty thousand for an electric car is way less costly than getting an extra unit and not having to build another parking spot, so. The people that live there get the benefit of free usage of electric car. Because it's electric, you don't have to worry about who's filling up with gas. It can be powered by the building. Um, and so it was an idea that they hadn't really thought about that allowed them us to get that exception. And then the case studies, which I sort of mentioned before. All of these things are fine as ideas. But no one, if you're doing this as a developer or an individual homeowner, they're not going to let you do it the first time. They're going to want to see that it's been done before. And so that means the only people that can do these things are people that can pay 
cash out of pocket. They can afford to skip financial institutions that have the time to go through a really lengthy permitting process and explain all those things. We actually, with our business model, we benefit with the more difficult the challenge. It makes for better content. So we're in this really great position where we can actually produce these case studies and help other people sort of uh, try to pull ideas from them and have like proved out things that will make everybody feel a little bit more secure. So why I'm optimistic? Uh, you know, I've, I've done other things in the past. I've, you know, I have an architecture firm, and uh, I've, I've done some tech stuff before and been an advisor for a lot of startups. And at, at, at the age I am now and sort of where I'm at, I'm, I'm really happy because, I mean, yes, you can scale. You can always take on more responsibility and more stress. But to have like high revenue with a low burn rate really lets you innovate in and not just lets you innovate, it lets you be wrong. It affords you the opportunity to get it wrong the first time. And being able to get it wrong the first time lets you take bigger risks. When you try to own a solution, right, especially for something that's, that matters and is important, you kind of have to believe it even when you're wrong. Like if you're trying to create the best solar panel, you kind of have to really hope that you're better than the competitor's solar panels, because uh, otherwise you're kind of out of business. And I've seen with so many startups that I've been involved with, where you know, even the ones that go, there's, there's so much waste along the way, right? Because the, you, you have to make it work, and it's often a zero-sum game. So the ability to monetize research, research and experimentation, I think, is like such a competitive advantage for innovation. Capital in the form of attention is really interesting. It can be deployed without being depleted. Uh, it also gives you access to specialized skill sets. We don't have to have a team of really expensive researchers. We don't have to have someone in our small team that knows how to uh, work with AI and produce uh, construction documents for architecture projects. We can deploy our attention capital and kind of get access to those things and become an advisor with equity in their companies. Um, and then again, we're incentivized to empathize. Uh, to make videos that people want to watch, you have to think how a lot of people think. It's kind of like playing like Family Feud. It's like the opposite of Jeopardy, where you have to be smart. You have to think like basic. When it comes to these kind of things, you have to really try to figure out what are people searching for? How, how are they thinking about the bathroom renovation? What do they think affordable is? And I kind of like that there's that kind of accountability uh, built into it. So with that, uh, thanks again for making these awesome platforms and having me here. And happy to answer any questions. In your podcast, you talk a little about creativity and how it doesn't really come from this black magic area, but it's actually, it emerges out of a very structured process that you go through. You've got some amazingly creative things and just wanted you to talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so uh, we use the phrase, uh, seriously ridiculous, but ridiculously serious. Um, and I think that's, that I, I get that from, from like, well, I think that's how kids actually, or why people think kids are creative. People think that when kids are playing, they're like being silly. They're not. If you look at a, a kid's face when they're you know, pretending to be a fireman or something like that, they're deathly serious. They're, they're simulating what they, they see in the future, and that's why it's, it's so cute and adorable. Um, so yeah, that's what we try to do. It's like we, we want to be flexible enough to think laterally and broadly, and so we encourage that kind of ridiculousness, um, but it's all still serious at the same time. The other thing we do is just prototype earlier. Start working with your hands, build full scale, draw full scale, make a mess, get the cardboard out. Everyone's got a ton of Amazon boxes right now. If you're planning a kitchen renovation, just save your Amazon boxes for like a week and you could probably like mock up your whole kitchen with some duct tape. Awesome talk, I thought that was really, really interesting. Um, one question I have is since we are at Google with YouTube, obviously, and there's actually a subscriptions team at this office uh, for YouTube subscriptions. Um, just wondering for your channel and your subscribers, um, are there, in terms of new kind of features, are there ways that you wish that you could interact more with your audience or hear from them or communicate with them or any engagement opportunities with your subscribers? Anyone with a lot of subscribers will tell you they want more access to their subscribers. And I'm, I get that. I mean, we would make more money if we could reach our subscribers directly. Uh, subscribers don't really matter as far as I'm concerned now. Like, we spent five years building up a channel, um, got to a million subscribers, but the average videos on that channel are way lower than the one that we just started with five videos. Um, and 
I think that's actually healthy for uh, the ecosystem the ecosystem in general that it makes you actually have to innovate around the content that people want to watch. You don't just have this, this captive, this audience that's there. Now, so selfishly, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to, to, to reach your own base a little bit more, but I get it, and there's, it just puts the challenge on creative stuff. When did you make the decision to leave the architecture firm and actually switch to just doing this full time? There was an in-between phase where I started a company called Free Green, where we published uh, affordable blueprints for homes and then sold advertising directly into the architectural construction documents. So we did this out of the same building as my architecture firm. I still, you know, to this day, I'm still a partner in that architecture firm, Zero Energy Design. So uh, I didn't leave it completely, but I just left it as like my sort of day-to-day -day focus. All right, question. So I love DIY um, videos on YouTube, um, but I've also been bitten quite a few times by <laughs> these kind of like oversimplification phenomena where I'm trying to do something, I go online and I find these like videos and they look so easy. I'm like, oh, I totally can do it. And I, as soon as I start doing it, it's just so hard because they, people like edit out the, the, the most Yes. Called parts. So, so what do you make of that? One, it's people are designing the video to a separate criteria than they are the instruction. So YouTube, from what I understand, really highly prioritizes watch time, right? So you want to keep the pacing so fast because you don't want people to click away. I know a video will get shared more if the you know, average duration percentage is over 50%. It's going to get served up to more people. That incentivizes content creators to speed up the pace to almost a mind-numbingly difficult to follow uh, level. So I actually think one thing that would be helpful is creating, you know, there's sort of the how-to category, but if you actually created an instructional category that had a slightly different requirements that was much uh, more about people that are looking for quality of information rather than just speed and uh, ambient watching, I think that would be a really interesting thing, although way above my pay grade in, in terms of how that would actually happen. Um, the other thing is look for people that offer supporting documentation. That's one of the reasons why for a lot of projects we'll offer like a PDF download and stuff like that. Um, we think chapterized video is actually the best way to do uh, instructional video content. Um, I think with mobile, like uh, apps like Jump Rope are doing a really great job of that. Uh, I highly encourage people to check it out where you can basically chapterize video, upload segments, add annotations, and all that kind of stuff. And so you can just watch that one step repeat until you got it. That being said, it wasn't like paper instructions for that grade anyways, right? Like, have you ever like opened up a box and looked at just indecipherable hieroglyphics and just been like, yep, I know better off than just making it up as I go. I wonder, this, this may be for Google people as well, in the educational sector, um, online learning, and online degrees is, has been a big, uh, in some cases, it's been a big revenue um, producer, but it's also uh, an area where universities have gotten you know, their heads handed to them in terms of the, the deals that have been cut and the revenue that actually goes away to the, um, these online companies. I'm wondering um, whether YouTube is, is an option um, that you see or that Google sees for um, some of the problems that institutions are having with um, the, the traditional kind of big players within the online education game? I think the, the opportunity is more of a competitive one than necessarily like one way of fixing it for all universities. So I think you know, the universities that want to get, let's say the goal was like, you know what? We, we could use uh, YouTube to increase the quality of applicants coming in. That would be the really obvious play. And it would just be painting a clearer picture of what academic life is for an architecture department, really showing what the studio environment is. I think so few high school students have no idea what an architectural education is going to be like. So the more that's painted as a clear picture of, of what an engaging, exciting, creative, uh, community-based experience that is, they're going to have a, a competitive advantage from getting better applicants. On the sort of, uh, you know, a lot of universities sort of uh, make a lot of their lecture series available, and I think that's really great. Um, I think as you know, someone that grew up in a small suburban town, we didn't have access to these kind of thinkers. I mean, let alone just urban situations in general. So I think that's already like super beneficial that 
you know, pe people even in the most remote locations can, can have access to those kind of ideas. Um, and then also, I think, just encouraging the students to do that. It was something when I was teaching at Northeastern, uh, the, there's a class called Environmental Systems. And it's sort of like, it's not the most exciting class. It's sort of the HVAC design class. But they are learning about sort of passive solar design, about sun angles, about uh, thermal properties of buildings. And so the assignment was to make a YouTube video where they had to take one thing that they learned in the textbook and make it, uh, represent it in a way that somebody else could improve their homes. And the students now are so much better at making videos than they are at writing. Um, and that's such a powerful way of reaching people. And that's not something to be taken lightly. It, you talk to any business that's trying to reach people, they're trying to do it with video, and they're having a really hard time doing it. And these young digital natives are extraordinarily good at it right out of the gate. Well, thank you for having us. Thank you.